Therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Financial Accountability Officer's report on the Liberals' unfair hydro scheme wasn't shocking to the opposition. We have been saying all along this simply is a boring plan that kicks the can down the road. At the lowest estimate, this plan will cost taxpayers $21 billion, wow. and at the highest, a staggering $93 billion. This plan is not about sharing cost, it's about saving seats. Not only will this cost the next generation billions of dollars, but the generation after that too. This is a short-sighted re-election scheme. Mr. Speaker, is this unfair hydro scheme really about burdening Ontario with another $93 billion of debt, or is it about helping the Liberal Party? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our Fair Hydro Plan is about helping people in this province. It's about helping mom and pop businesses on Main Streets, Mr. Speaker, and it's about helping farms, farmers, Mr. Speaker. It's about people who need relief on their electricity bill getting that relief. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. The member from Beaches, East York, come to order. And if I'm getting signals, I will deal with them. Premier. Mr. Speaker, the member for Renfrew Nip Nipissing, uh, in his usual um, thoughtful way, is heckling about the last 14 years. Mr. Speaker, over the last 14 years, we've invested in the electricity system in this province so that we have a clean, renewable system, Mr. Speaker, that had been degraded by the very party that the uh, member opposite is a member of. And, Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, government after government had not made the investments that needed to be made. So, electricity prices were kept artificially low, Mr. Speaker. The system was degraded. We had to make these investments, and, Mr. Speaker, Answer. we're spreading the cost of those investments over a longer period of time. Yeah. That's fair today, and it's fair Thank tomorrow, you. Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The Premier said she was investing in the electricity system over the last 14 years. Well, stop investing, because under your watch, you've raised hydro rates 400 per cent. They've broken hydro in Ontario. Every time they touch hydro, they make it worse. So I've got a simple. Leader. Mr. Speaker, I've got a simple, simple multiple choice question for the Premier. How many billions of taxpayer dollars is the Premier willing to spend on this hydro scheme for her re election campaign? A, $21 billion, question. B, $45 billion, or C, $93 billion? Which is it? A, B, or C? How much taxpayer dollars Thank are you, you going to waste Four. for the self? The signals have been sent. I'm moving to warnings. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's very clear that the uh... member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Carry on. It's very clear that the uh, Leader of the Opposition has a very different philosophy of uh, how to grow this province and make it strong, Mr. Speaker. He would stop investing, apparently, in the new hospital in Moose and Emu's factory. He would stop investing in the transit that makes Bracebridge able to have a, a bus. The member from here on Bruce, the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. 
investing in small town infrastructure like Grace Bridges. He would stop investing in a clean, yeah. renewable electricity grid, Mr. Speaker, and he would stop investing in the education and the uh, and the health care resources that are allowing this province to thrive. He would stop investing, Mr. Speaker. That's not a plan. That's that is a strategy. Member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. I can do this all day. Carry on. That is a strategy for undermining the growth of this yes, province. Sir. We're not going to go there, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. So, final supplementary. Again, to the Premier, and the Premier is absolutely correct for once. I will stop investing in bad Liberal contracts. According to the Auditor General, we overpaid $9.2 billion. That's our investment, overpaid by $9.2 billion. The 30 companies that got the contracts, surprise, surprise, donated $1.3 million to the Ontario Liberal Party. That's the investment they're proud of. They have supported the Liberal Party's bank account, not Ontario ratepayers. And everyone sees it. Everyone in the province sees it. Just read the Globe and Mail this weekend. In the Globe and Mail, I quote, unless you're planning on living off the grid, in Algonquin Park or moving out of the province by 2028, you will be materially worse off under this scheme than had the Liberals just left bad enough alone. Question. This plan is going to hurt Ontario. Why won't the Premier just do the right thing and admit they have broken hydro in Ontario? Stop trying to make it worse. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, we've invested in the electricity system in this province. It is clean, it is renewable, and it is reliable, and Mr. Speaker. And people need relief on their electricity bills because of the investments that have been made in order to get us there. And we're spreading the cost of those investments over a longer period of time. And I'm happy, Mr. Speaker, to talk to the next, gener next generation about that, that they are going to be able to access an asset that we've invested in that we fixed, Mr. Speaker, because previous governments were not able to or not willing to. Mr. Speaker, the investments that we have made in this province. Let's, let's look at what those investments have led to. Ontario has created almost 700,000 new jobs since the recession, almost 300,000 since I became Premier, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's economic growth has led all G7 nations for the past three years. Our unemployment rate has dropped to 5.8 percent, Mr. Oh. Speaker, its lowest level in 16 years. That's what investment That's in the right. province has gained us, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please. New question, the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Another day, another Liberal partisan advertisement. This time it was the recent same budget old, old. ads. It's becoming quite repetitive around here these days. First, the Liberals spend millions of taxpayer dollars on advertising. Second, the Auditor General says the ads are clearly partisan. Third, the Liberals spew some nonsense about Ontario prohibiting partisan advertising. Rinse and repeat, it is the same lines. Mr. Stop. Minister, Minister of Indigenous uh, Relations and Reconciliation is warned. I saw somebody else over in the corner, but just carry on, please. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier just come clean to the people of Ontario and admit these ads are wrong? They are partisan. The Premier is using taxpayer dollars to benefit the Ontario Liberal Party. Do the right thing. Cancel these ads. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, I would say that, uh, as the Leader of the Opposition knows, Ontario is the only province in the country that has advertising restrictions, Mr. Speaker, that are legislated. Mr. Speaker, we've made it very clear that uh, partisan advertising is not allowed. And, Mr. Speaker, the benchmark that's used for partisan advertising is what the, that party did when it was in office, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it's quite clear. It's quite clear that because of our legislation, we have moved very far away from that uh, that partisan advertising. But, but Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity. 
opportunity to be in Northeast Ontario and uh, Northeastern Ontario over the last week. And uh, one stop that I made in Sudbury was at a, um, a unit in the hospital called Neo Kids. And I had the opportunity to meet with families there, Mr. Speaker, who have kids who are uh, chronically ill or they have very serious illness, Mr. Speaker, and many of them need regular medication Answer. every day, every month, Mr. That's Speaker. Right. They were very happy to know that OHIP Plus Pharmacare is starting Thank on you. January 1, 2018. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier and back to the actual question. From Wawa to Petawawa, from Perry Sound to Owen Sound, from Capuscasing to Nipissing, what do we have in common? These are towns that are opposition-held ridings, and as reported in QP briefing, I quote, the Auditor General's office noted this could suggest that these areas were targeted for that reason. And I agree with the Auditor General. Without a doubt, the Liberal government is campaigning using taxpayer dollars in opposition writings. It's unethical. It should be illegal. And Mr. Speaker, I will ask the Premier again. Will the Premier do the right thing and stop abusing taxpayer dollars for the, per for the sole purpose of benefiting the Liberal Party? Mr. Speaker, I absolutely understand why the Leader of the Opposition does not want us to talk about our budget. I absolutely understand that. He does not want to, especially, Mr. Speaker, especially— The member from Renfrew and Nipissing Pembroke is warned. And by the way, those that are warned, the next is naming. Especially given what he said earlier today, Mr. Speaker, is that his strategy would be to stop investing in Ontario. So he doesn't want us to talk about the 100,000 childcare spaces that we'll create, no, Mr. Speaker. He, he doesn't want us to talk about free tuition because that's an investment in the people and the young people of this province. He doesn't want us to talk about OHIP. Plus, Mr. Speaker, because that's an investment of the children and the youth of this province who need medication, and it's an investment in their families to allow them to make ends meet and support their children. He doesn't want us to talk about yes, any of that, Mr. Speaker, because his strategy is just to stop investing in the people of this province. You see it, please. You see it, please. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell is warned. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The, the word investing is all of a sudden code word for what is acceptable to abuse taxpayer dollars. Investing in partisan liberal ads, you call that investment? People right now in Ontario are struggling to get by. They can't pay their hydro bills, and yet you've got a government wasting millions on partisan ads. This isn't the opposition parties saying this. This is the Auditor General, the independent legislative oversight, saying this is wrong. This is unethical. We get the same spin, the same talking points. Abusing taxpayer dollars is not investing. It is wrong. When will this Liberal government learn? Stop abusing taxpayer dollars. Do what's right and pull these ads. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I say to the Leader op of the Opposition once again, he knows full well that there's only one province in this country that has legislation that forbids partisan advertising, that has standards, Mr. Speaker, and that is Ontario. And we are, uh, we are the government that moved on that, Mr. Speaker. But I will go back to what the Leader of the Opposition does not want to see us talking about. He does not, Mr. Speaker, want us to talk about the capital investments that we are making in hospitals. He does not want us to talk about the fact that in Moose Factory, there is a hospital that was built in 1950, Mr. Speaker, and he doesn't want us to talk about the fact that we're going to rebuild that hospital. We're going to replace that hospital, Mr. Speaker. He doesn't want us to talk about that because that's an investment in the province. It's an yeah. investment in the people of Moose Factory and the James Bay Post. Yeah. He also doesn't want us to talk about the fact that we are putting a 2 percent max minimum uh, Answer. investment Answer. in every oper operating budget in the hospitals in this province, and that, Mr. Speaker, is Thank an you. investment in people in every corner of Ontario. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier recently put forward a new law that will force all electricity companies to include her political messaging with hydro bills right up until the next election. In fact, 
Her regulation contains the exact messaging that she plans to force the companies to use. How can this Premier justify this shameless self-promotion at the expense of everyday families in Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm, I know that the Minister of Energy is going to want to uh, speak to the details of this, but Mr. Speaker, I am quite sure that uh, even the leader of the third party would like to see everyone who's eligible receive the uh, the uh, reduction that they uh, that they are are. Uh, um, that they're eligible for, that they're entitled to, <laughs> that they're entitled to. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that the leader of the third party knows, because she's been talking about it in this, in this legislature for weeks, Mr. Speaker, she knows that people need that relief on their hydro bills. She knows, Mr. Speaker, that people need that 25 per cent reduction. She knows, Mr. Speaker, that in rural and remote communities that people need even more than that because distribution charges are so high. So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the leader of the third party supports a reduction, Mr. Speaker, and the Minister of Energy will speak to the details yes, of sir. what's in the bill. Thank you very much. That's the whole point. People are going to get it, regardless if there's partisan advertising in the bills or not. So why is this Premier doing that? Look, this law forces electricity companies to do the Premier's dirty work by trying to sell the people of Ontario on her $45 billion hydro borrowing scheme. This is a new low speaker in political manipulation at the expense of Ontario families who are already struggling to just keep up with their skyrocketing bill. Speaker. Is this Premier so desperate to save her political skin that she is going to force families to pay for her own? Partisan advertising. Terrible. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise and talk about our Fair Hydro Plan because I find it interesting from the questioning from the leader of the third party. Because just last week, Mr. Speaker, when I was in Sault Ste. Marie and when I spoke with Steve and Lucy, who own the M&Ms and the other country-style donuts that the leader of the opposition spoke to. I found it very interesting that they didn't know about the Fair Hydro Plan. They didn't know about the benefits that they were going to be getting when the Fair Hydro Plan uh, passes, Mr. Speaker. But it's interesting, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the third party chose not to tell them about the plan. She chose not to tell them about all of the things that will be coming, Mr. Speaker. So you know what we're doing, Mr. Speaker? We're going to ensure that we... Finish, please. I know, Mr. Speaker, that we have one party that doesn't have a plan. We have a new party. We'd like to hear what that new party will have to say. And then from the third party, Mr. Speaker, they don't even talk about their plan anymore. We will ensure that Answer. we talk about our plan so everybody in this province knows that they'll be getting 25 percent off before summer. Final supplementary. Speaker, everybody in Ontario will be shocked when they see their bill. They'll be shocked to learn that they're now paying for the Liberals' advertising to be delivered right to their store doorstep by, by law, Speaker, because the Liberals are putting it in legislation, in regulation to put the advertising for that party into people's bills. People expected so much better from this Premier, but time and time again, they have been let down. Instead of forcing electricity companies to advertise her borrowing scheme, will the Liberal Premier instead put her energy into coming up with a plan that helps people instead of helping her political party and herself? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 800,000 families in this province will see a 40 to 50 percent reduction. Thank you to the Premier and this government bringing forward legislation, Mr. Speaker, that will help families. Every single household in this province, Mr. Speaker, 500,000 small businesses and farms, they will receive a 25 percent reduction on average, Mr. Speaker, come summer when we can get this legislation passed. But what really is bothersome, Mr. Speaker, is last week the NDP confirmed that they would repeal the Fair Hydro Plan. The admission, courtesy of the uh, candidate in Sault Ste. Marie, and that comes as a shock to everyone. For months, we've talked about the need to help families with the cost of electricity, but when we could have supported a plan to cut bills by 25 per cent for those low incomes between 40 and 50, you know what they said, Mr. Speaker? No. We'll have to find out. Uh, the, member, <laughs> the member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. 
You may now finish. As I was saying, Mr. Speaker, you know what they said, Mr. Speaker? No. No. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but I have to say I look forward to forming a government and cleaning up the mess that these Liberals have made in our electricity system. In her and it's going to happen. In her political in her political insert, Speaker, the Premier isn't even telling the people of, of Ontario the whole story. Stop the clock. A member from Etobicoke North is warned. And plenty more are waiting. You're just sitting too close to me. Carry on, please. Political insert, Speaker. The Premier isn't even telling the people of Ontario the whole story. Not even close. She's leaving out the part about her hydro borrowing plan, wiping out any savings for families and costing Ontarians much, much more in the long run. Why is the Premier okay with telling Ontarians only half the story? Mr. Speaker. We've been very clear with the people of Ontario, and we'll continue to be clear with the people of Ontario that we, we understand that the investments that we've made in the electricity system in this province had a cost associated with them, Mr. Speaker, and that that cost is being borne right now by this generation, and that this is an asset that is going to last for many, many years, Mr. Speaker, and that we are going to spread the cost over a longer period. Like a mortgage, Mr. Speaker, there is a cost associated with doing that. Uh, we've been very clear from the moment we brought out this plan. Mr. Speaker, but this is a plan that is being implemented right now. People are going to see these reductions. They're already beginning to see these reductions, and they will see full implementation by summer if the legislation passes, Mr. Speaker. Not in 2020, not somewhere down the line if the federal government agrees to do something maybe sometime, Mr. Speaker, as the, as the NDP Answer. strategy would have had it. We're acting right now, helping people right now with their electricity bills, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Well, well, here's a news flash, Speaker. She's so clear that nobody believes her anymore. Nobody believes a word she says anymore. That's how clear she's been with the people of Ontario. In about four years, Speaker, in about four years, Ontarians will see the whole truth of this plan in black and white, in the form of higher hydro bills that are going to continue to skyrocket for the next 30 years. By neglecting to include this fact in her political insert, the Premier is showing Ontarians once again where her priorities lie, with herself and her party. The Premier is willing to tell Ontario families and businesses a half-truth in hopes that it is going to bring her uh, power or hang on to her power for just a little bit longer. Speaker. That is the M.O. of this Premier and her Liberal government. Question. Will she so show some leadership? Will she so sh show some respect for the people of this province and withdraw that odious re Thank regulation you. immediately? Thank you. Minister of, Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that 25 per cent is coming off of everyone's bills, Mr. Speaker, right across the province. Small businesses, farms, and families. And I hear they keep talking about four years, Mr. Speaker. For the next four years, it is true, we are holding the cost to the rate of inflation. That's good news in the short term, and it's good news in the medium term, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes to the long term, it is this party, the only party that actually has a plan, Mr. Speaker, that is working now, is going to work in the medium term, and is going to work in the long term. Our long -term term energy plan, Mr. Speaker, will continue to find ways to pull costs out of the system. Their pamphlet, their ideas, is coming up with some type of pie-in-the-sky committee that will actually talk about things, Mr. Speaker. We're acting. We're making sure that we're reducing bills now, Answer. in the future, and we'll continue to look after Ontarians in the long term as well, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you. Final supplementary. <laughs> Well, Ontarians are smart, and I think that they're going to see right through this Liberal hydro scheme, Speaker. Yeah. They'll see through the Premier's $45 billion hydro plan, and they will see these political inserts for exactly what they are. A sneaky way for the Premier to try to save her own political skin leading up to the next election. Will this Premier stop the political games once and for all? Stop the political games and withdraw this regulation immediately. Thank you. You see this, please. You see this, please. Thank you, Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let's be clear. The LDCs and uh, the government advertise for price updates, Mr. Speaker, for rate hearings, for programs like the Ontario Electricity Support Program, which they're voting against, Mr. Speaker, the Save on Energy Program, which will help small businesses, which they're voting against, Mr. Speaker. It seems, you know, they like to say no to everything. No to that expanded Ontario Electricity Support Program. No to the new $200 million affordability fund for families, and no to eliminating the delivery cost on on reserve First Nations, Mr. Speaker. I know um, Regional Chief Day and Chief uh, Ava Hill have talked about how this fair hydro plan is going to change the lives of many First Nations peoples, Mr. Speaker, and that is something that this premier and this government is doing. It seems, Mr. Speaker, that the party opposite has been watching a little bit too much Letter Kenny. All they've been saying is it's a hard no, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Wow. New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. It's not just the financial accountability officer who weighed in on the government's hydro scheme. The Auditor General attended the hydro committee hearings last week and exposed yet another secret. The government plans on borrowing all these billions and not declaring it on their books. Well, the Liberals got caught again. The auditor said, quote, for obvious reasons, this is not allowed under Canadian public sector accounting standards. They tried to bury all these billions and not have the cost of their scheme show up anywhere. Did they think they were not going to get caught, Speaker? I asked the Premier, why does it always take the Auditor General, the Financial Accountability Officer, or the OPP for the people of Ontario to get to the truth? Wow. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. Let's remind everyone in this House that the process that's being proposed is being endorsed by Pricewaterhouse, uh, by, Dun by a number of accounting uh, professionals in the system. It's being uh, enabled to protect the interests of ratepayers and consumers, Mr. Speaker. It's enabling them to benefit from lower costs today and taking an asset that's registered and enabling it to be valued over a longer period of time. And that is what's being established. It's being established to reduce rates today and enable us to provide for a good system, a clean, reliable system system throughout the future, Mr. S uh, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite may oppose that. He may wish not to provide for lowering of rates. He may uh, decide that it's not appropriate for an asset to be registered yes, and extended over a period of time, but professionals in the accounting system have decided that that is appropriate. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Well, that's not what the Auditor General decided. Two weeks ago, we asked the government why they co-opted OPG as the financing arm of this hydro scheme. We asked if if it's because the billions this hydro scheme will add to OPG's debt won't show up on the province's book. Despite all their denials, the Auditor General has confirmed that's exactly what this government was planning. They plan to spend billions now, bury that money on OPG's books, and not have the province account for any of this debt. But the Auditor General says, no way, they got caught yet again. I asked the Premier, now that your scheme has been revealed, will you drop this charade with OPG and properly account for these billions on the province's books? So, Mr. Speaker, again, I remind the member opposite that the, the process that's been delivered here has been done in consultations with numerous experts. Over 18 jurisdictions in North America have provided and utilized a similar accounting practice within the system. We have been working with OPG, who, by the way, has the necessary expertise in assisting with the financing. They currently manage over $18 billion in nuclear funds and that can be used in infrastructure and expertise in this field to help administer long-term financing, Mr. Speaker. This is not a novel approach. This has been done in other jurisdictions. Duke Energy in North Carolina, Long Island Lighting in Long Island have done it as well. Mr. Speaker, we are moving forward to help consumers, to help our people in Ontario, to help our businesses be more competitive. The member opposite obviously don't have a plan. They don't want to invest. Yes, they sir. made that clear, and now they're going to vote down something that's going to help the people of Ontario and our businesses. And that, Mr. Speaker, is a shame. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. Last week, the Financial Accountability Officer confirmed what Ontarians already knew. The Premier's wrong-headed hydro-borrowing scheme will end up costing families and businesses more in the long run. 
The borrowing scheme will add nearly $45 billion to Ontario Hydro bills after a few years of temporary relief. In light of this confirmation, now there can be no doubt about the effect of this politically motivated scheme does the Premier plan to present Ontarians with a better option? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we work very closely with the Financial Accountability Officer to provide information and analysis on our proposed Fair Hydro plan, and we welcome uh, his final report, Mr. Speaker, because the FAO report confirms the foundation of the Fair Hydro plan, a cut in electricity rates by 25 percent on average for all residential consumers and as many as a half a million small businesses and farms, Mr. Speaker. And what's more, rate increases will be held to the rate of inflation for four years, while low-income Ontarians and those living in eligible rural and northern communities would see savings of up to 40 to 50 percent. And it's important to remember, Mr. Speaker, that the FAO's projection of electricity City costs reflects a point in time estimate that demonstrates how we can ensure greater fairness and affordability in the short term and medium term. And for the long term, we are focused on our long term energy plan, which will lay out our plan to continue to keep costs down. Families in the province, Mr. Speaker, have asked for real, immediate relief on their electricity yes, bills, and that's why we are working to deliver the largest rate reduction in Ontario's history if this legislation is passed, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier. The FAO is a non-partisan, independent officer of the legislature whose sole job is to protect the people of Ontario. He told us, without doubt, that Ontario families and businesses will be worse off in 10 years under the Premier's hydro scheme than they would be if there was no intervention at all. How can the Premier just ignore the FAO and forge ahead when she knows, knows that her plan will end up doing more damage than good? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Sp uh, Speaker. Again, a 25 per cent reduction in the short term holding the cost to inflation for the next four years and bringing forward the long-term energy plan will continue to keep the uh, rates as low as possible for families, small businesses and farms right across our great province, Mr. Speaker. And as mentioned, um, it's important to remember the FAO's uh, projection of electricity costs. Um, it reflects a point in time that estimates and demonstrates how we can ensure greater fairness and affordability in the short and the medium term, Mr. Speaker. The FAO report confirmed uh, the foundation of the Fair Hydro Plan, that we will be reducing rates by 25 per cent on average for families, small businesses and farms right across our province, Mr. Speaker. And for those that live in rural and northern parts of our Answer. province, they will see a 40 to 50 per cent reduction thanks to us in the Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker. The opposition parties are voting against that. Your question, the member from Toronto North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la ministre. De... I have a question for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. Recently, I see that the Francophonie has even more of an influence in the province and I'm thrilled with this. In my community, uh, they're very involved in Northern, uh, Etobicoke North. I participated in uh, the official opening of the Notre Dame de Grasse Catholic School. I would like to know what our government is doing for Franco-Ontarians over the past few years. Could the minister talk to us about the government's commitment to support Franco-Ontarians? The minister. Thank you very much. But first, I'd like to thank uh, the member from Etobicoke North and for his uh, constant support for Franco-Ontarians. I'd like to remind you first that our government has always been strongly committed to Franco-Ontarian communities and all their diversity. Mr. Speaker, we have fought, we fought for Montfort Hospital, which was threatened with being closed by the Conservatives. We have a commissioner for French services, and this commissioner is independent. We officially recognized the 25th September as the Day of Franco-Ontarians, and throughout the province, we commemorated the 400th anniversary of the Francophone presence in Ontario, and recently, we made Ontario unobserved an observer member to the Francophonie. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pl uh, proud of our plan and our vision for the future. Question? 
Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for her response. It's important to have a government that continue, continues to show its commitment to Franco-Ontarians through concrete action. Mr. Speaker, other initiatives could also support the Francophone community today and tomorrow. The participation in Franco-Ontarians is seen throughout Ontario society, and I have seen it myself in Ottawa Vanier and throughout uh, Ontario from Timmins to Sudbury. Could the minister explain to us how our government is working now to support Francophones on a daily basis? Thank you. The minister? Good question. Thank you. I'd like to thank the member from Ottawa Vanier and mention uh, that this member is also a great supporter of the Francophonie in Ontario. For our government, contrary actions which move the Francophonie forward is of concern to us. I'd like to remind you of other concrete initiatives in our Francophone community. Last year, the uh, uh, Premier presented apologies in the House, and our communities appreciated this. Very soon, we're going to create a community fund for Francophones, and we will continue to open new Francophone schools throughout the province. We are working hard to improve access to just the justice system, and we have 26 designated regions covering 80% of Francophones in the province. Mr. Speaker, I've been working very hard with the Minister of Health to improve services in French. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will continue with my uh, next intervention. To the Premier. Premier. The government has wasted its fair share of taxpayer dollars. Oh, yeah. But we might just have a new gold standard, or should I say a big new yellow standard. Ah. New information shows that the Liberals have spent $200,000 for a rubber duck oh, to be parked in Toronto's waterfront. What rubber does duck. a rubber duck have to do with celebrating Canada's 150th birthday? Mr. Speaker was, and I quote, Kathleen's rubber ducky, unquote, really worth $200,000? Wow. Minister, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Yes, sir. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank the member opposite for his question, Speaker, and just note that on this side of the House, we're not ducking any of these questions, Speaker. <laughs> and the reason for that is this uh, celebration is part of our 150th anniversary of our province and our country, Speaker, a fact of which on this side of the House, we're enormously proud. This opportunity allows me the, and I thank the member for his question, because it allows me the opportunity to clarify on a number of fronts. Number one, we're supporting the Red Path Waterfront Festival through $121,325,000. And that's in Celebrate Ontario funding. Wow. And why is that important, Speaker? Because for every dollar that we spend, it triggers about $20 worth of ancillary wow, right. investments. Wow. And we know nice that that's investment. important. So it's also important to note that this festival is an annual summer event that provides people on land and on water programming Answer. for people of all ages. We're looking forward to taking part in that celebration, Speaker, and we know that this was an important investment to make. Thank you. Thank you, Supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, to the Premier, that answer is really quacking me up. Uh. <laughs> One giant rubber ducky, $200,000 out of taxpayers' pockets. This absurd waste of taxpayers' dollars yeah. is an absolute cluster duck. I ask the member to withdraw. I withdraw. I hope you can tell I'm not happy. You are on the W. Carry on. Thank you, Speaker. You know, people are already treading water, trying to pay their bills, and you float this rubber ducky right in their face? So, Mr. Speaker, how out of touch is this Liberal government? Thank you. Minister? You know, Speaker, uh, 
It's interesting when the member opposite raises an issue about uh, investments in our society because this is a classic case of you know, pouring cold water on an important festival that brings jobs and investment not just to Toronto but to cities across the province. Furthermore, Speaker, our investment in this festival, which does include this historic duck and who doesn't like ducks, Mr. Speaker? Again, not ducking the question, Speaker. Um, you know, I'm not against ducks. Perhaps the member opposite doesn't like ducks. I'm, I'm all about them. Perhaps we should ask the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, who also likes ducks, that we like uh, this kind of thing. But it's important to note, Speaker, that people from across this province this summer are going to celebrate in hundreds of thousands of ways. We're absolutely behind them, and this particular festival is going to be leveraged by other funding. The member should know that is also creating jobs and opportunities right across. Across Ontario. So again, Speaker, we're not quacking about anything. We're going to have fun this summer, and this is exactly the kind of investment Thank we should be making as a government. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener-Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Oh, Catherine, the Catherine. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Finish, please. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. The Changing Workplaces Review final report is out. There's no getting around it now. Hardworking Ontarians have waited 14 years for this Liberal government to acknowledge the struggles they face every day to balance work and families and bills that keep rising. Union jobs are good jobs, and we believe that it should be easier for more Ontarians to join unions. New Democrats have long called for a return to card-based union certification and first contract arbitration. Will the Premier commit to implementing, without further delay, card-based union certification and first contract arbitration protection today? Mr. Labor. Mr. Labor. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the honourable member for that question. It certainly is uh, on a lot of people's minds these days. The Change in Workplaces Review is complete. It was released to the public last week, Speaker, and tomorrow you're going to see a response from the government to that report, Good. Speaker. The, uh, the advisors, in my opinion, have done an incredible job canvassing the variety of opinions that are out there on things like scheduling, on things like unionization, card-based certification, remedial certification, um, hours of work, Speaker. All the things that have changed over the years, Speaker, in the last 25 to 30 years since we, 20 to 25 years since we looked at these acts, Speaker, the world of work has changed. It's shifted between our feet, Speaker, underneath our feet, and what we need to do is ensure that the legislation that we put in place mirrors the realities of the workplace today, Speaker. There's a number of people out there that are struggling that need to be assisted by some changes. I'm hoping when we see the uh, response from the government tomorrow, Thank you. it's going to move us forward, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Now, days off without reprisals is a start, but there is no ban on replacement workers in these recommendations. There is no automatic access to first contract arbitration, and millions of part-time, temporary, even full-time and multiple job holders are struggling to support their families, 58 per cent of whom are women, according to United Way study. They deserve the benefit of paid sick days and a $15 minimum wage. Will the Premier commit today? Will this government commit today? Because they might not have a chance after the next election to do so. Will she commit to implement, implementing paid sick days for every Ontario worker? And will the Premier, without delay, even after 14 years, commit to bringing in a $15 minimum wage for the workers in the province of Ontario. Minister. Speaker, clearly action is needed, Speaker, in order to make sure that the benefits of the incredible growing economy we have right now in the province of Ontario, Speaker. We're leading the G7. Unemployment is at uh, the lowest it's been in a number of years, Speaker. The economy is growing. It's doing well. We need to make sure that every Ontarian has the ability to share in that prosperity, Speaker. The response that will be coming forward tomorrow is going to ensure that hardworking Ontarians get treated with fairness, with decency and respect in the workplace, Speaker. There's a number of recommendations, certainly around wages, about scheduling. Speaker, you'll, you'll have a full response from the government tomorrow 
I suspect, Speaker, you're going to see that it meets the needs of the province of Ontario. And those people, Speaker, that are feeling a little insecure yes, these days, I think, once they see the response from this Premier, this government, Speaker, will feel a lot more confident Thank and you. secure at work. Wow. The question in the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the President of the Treasury Board. Our government committed to balancing the budget in 2017-2018, and we delivered that balanced budget, budget, Speaker. In 2009, when the recession hit, we said that our government would take a fair and balanced approach that focused on growing the economy and delivering the best possible value for every single dollar spent. For eight years in a row, our government beat deficit targets while improving the services that mattered most to Ontarians. We created over 700,000 jobs since the recession, and now the unemployment rate has dropped to 5.8 per cent. That's the lowest unemployment rate in 16 years, Mr. Speaker. Canada's big banks are forecasting that Ontario will lead, let me repeat, will lead the country in economic growth this year, Question. while economic success is being felt all across all sectors, including manufacturing, real estate, finance, Thank and you. technology. President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Kingston and the Islands. You know, in order to balance the budget, we've been very diligently managing, managing the growth in program spending. Over the past four years, we've had, held the annual growth in spending to 1.4 per cent while continuing to invest in priority programs and services like health care and education. You know, Speaker, in fiscal 2014-15, Treasury Board identified $250 million in efficiencies and reduced administrative overhead without affecting frontline services. In fiscal 2015-16, we identified a number of major initiatives to modernize public services, and we met our $500 million savings target. And we continue to realize Answer. savings by undergoing changes supported by the establishment of our Center of Excellence for Evidence-Based Decision Making. We will continue. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The PCs voted against our budget. Instead of investing in Ontarians, the PCs are desperately trying to not talk about our recent budget and all the important things that we're doing, all the important investments that we're making for Ontarians in their everyday lives. They keep repeating claims that our budget is in balance, flying in the face of facts. We're helping seniors cover the cost of public transit by introducing Ontario's seniors' public transit tax credit. We're increasing support for the most vulnerable through ODSP and OW by investing 480 $80 million more in the programs, and we're launching a basic income pilot to see if there's a better way to provide income security for people. The PCs vote against every single one of these items. Minister, can you please tell us more about what this program, what this budget does for Question. Ontarians? Minister. Thank you, Speaking, and, and it was indeed very disappointing to see the PCs vote against the budget because we're making medicine free for children and youth 24 and under so that no child in this province faces financial barriers to getting healthy. We're lowering electricity bills on average by 25 per cent to make people's electricity bills fairer. Through the Fair Housing Plan, we're making it easier to buy and rent a home. We're providing free tuition for 210,000 low- and middle-income students. We're creating 100,000 more affordable, quality child care spaces to help families in their everyday lives. So, Speaker, I ask the members opposite, which of these initiatives do you not support? Answer. Which ones would you not invest in? Which ones would you cut? Chair, please. Uh, question member, member from Perry Sound, Ms. Spoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Earlier this month in Ottawa, the Federal Minister of Natural Resources was asked a simple question. What is your government doing to support lumber remanufacturers? His answer, what is a, a lumber remanufacturer? Mr. Speaker, I know what a lumber remanufacturer is. I visited their facilities and heard their grave concerns for the future of their businesses. Does this minister know what a lumber remanufacturer is? Thank you, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. 
Well, it's interesting, and uh, thank you very much, Speaker, that I also met with the lumber remanufacturers in Ontario and heard their, their uh, concerns very clearly. On this side of the House, we've been taking stern action to make sure that our, our industry is protected here in the Government of Ontario. We have increased uh, our funding to be able to keep uh, our, our workers working on roads in the, in the far north. For the lumber remanufacturers themselves, they were able to outline the concerns. They know that we have hired Chief Negotiator uh, Jim Peterson to be able to continue those conversations uh, in, in uh, the U.S. And on this side of the House, all options are on the table. We sent a letter to Minister Carr months ago to be able to advocate for uh, ensuring that we have— And, sir? Sorry, that we have— um, a guaranteed loan program. We continue to uh, keep that conversation going, especially with our lumber rea manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you. Well, supplementary. Again, to, to the Minister of Natural Resources, Speaker, the lumber rea manufacturing sector is responsible for more than 4,400 full-time permanent Ontario jobs. They are concerned with softwood lumber tariffs. Northern Ontarians have been asking for support from the Premier and their Minister of Natural Resources and are hearing nothing but silence. The government is failing them. They need their government to support them while they continue to create jobs and stimulate the economy. Speaker, will the minister explain why she is not doing her job in advocating to her counterpart in Ottawa for good Ontario jobs? Will the minister pledge her support to this small but vital softwood lumber sector today? Thank you, minister. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you for the supplementary. It is the federal government's uh, negotiation that goes on south of the border. I'm not sure if the minister opposite knows that, the member opposite. But we on this side of the House are continuing to advocate. We have had uh, continual dialogue with our federal and provincial colleagues. We all have chief negotiators who are down doing their business across the states. We have made sure that our business sectors are speaking to business sectors across the border. We have ensured that we have people at the table talking union to union. We know exactly what these lumber manufacturers are underneath. We have not taken anything off the table yet. We are continuing to support our industry. We are continuing to look at all options on the table, and we continue those dialogues yes, to ensure that we have a strong softwood lumber sector in this province, and we continue to support those lumber remanufacturers. Thank, Thank you. you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week in Sault Ste. Marie, I announced that an NDP government would fund the province's fair share to keep the Huron Central Railway line to Sudbury open for business. This rail line is essential for protecting and creating good jobs in the Sioux. Does the Premier plan to keep this rail line operating, Speaker? Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Of course, uh, as I've said many times uh, in uh, in this chamber and in every any, every corner of the province, uh, we are a government that's absolutely committed to continuing to make the right kinds of investments, strategic investments in the infrastructure that we need in every corner of Ontario, Speaker. Uh, whether we're talking about Northern Ontario, whether we're talking about the, uh, the South, Speaker, highways, transit, transportation, all forms of transportation, Speaker. That's why in this year's budget. We literally added billions of dollars to our infrastructure plan so that over the next, I believe it's 12 years, Speaker, we're talking about $130 plus billion dollars that will flow through, these, uh, through this program out to the 444 communities across the province. would be happy to provide a bit more of a, uh, a more extensive answer in the follow-up question to the leader of the third party. Thanks very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Forward to the details from the Minister of Transportation or the Premier, because the fact of the matter is this rail line is the rail line that 65 per cent of the goods that are produced at SR Steel travel. 65 per cent of the goods that are on that rail line are from SR Steel. So we need some details, Speaker, because without a firm commitment from this Premier and her Liberal government to help fund the improvements to keep this line open, people in the Sioux will continue to be devastated by job losses. Too many young people have already left the Sioux because of the lack of jobs and the uncertainty that this Premier's policies have created in that part of Northern Ontario. So, will the Premier actually step up and undo some of the damage that her Liberals have already done by agreeing to fund the province's fair share Question. of the HCRY rail line? Well, 
Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, speaker, thanks very much. Uh, happy to uh, take the follow-up question from the leader of the NDP, uh, and also happy from the Ministry of Transportation's perspective to have a conversation here on this side with my colleague, the Minister of Northern Development and Mines, around this specific request, Speaker. So uh, there will be an opportunity, I'm sure, to provide additional details with respect to the specific question that's being asked today. But I will say, Speaker, in my time here in this legislature, not only as the Minister of Transportation, but as an MPP proud to represent Bond, year after year, this government, our Premier, our Finance Minister, have literally come forward with budgets on an annual basis that have contained billions of dollars to support, whether we're talking about goods movement transportation or commuter transportation, Speaker, and almost every year, almost every year without exception, Speaker. Wow. The Leader of the Third Party is warned. Carry on. Thanks, Speaker. As I was saying, almost without exception, the leader of the third party and members of her caucus have consistently voted against budgets that contain funding to support the transportation network that we are working hard to build across the province of Ontario. And now, Sir? shockingly, Speaker, on the eve of a by-election in Sault Ste. Marie, this question comes across the floor to me. The timing is certainly curious. Thanks very much, Speaker. Your question, Mr. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Status of Women. Speaker, this month is Sexual Assault Prevention Month, and during this month, month we must address the causes of sexual assault and violence that affects the lives of one in three women, and we look ahead to the work that needs to be done to create an inclusive and safer Ontario. And I know that the work we do as a province, that we have done extraordinary work to prevent sexual assaults by focusing on ways to raise awareness in the Provincial Sexual Violence and Harassment Action Plan. Now, Speaker, I remember almost 25 years ago getting my first white ribbon from then Councillor Jack Layton to help raise, uh, raise awareness amongst men against sexual, sexual assault against women. And so, Speaker, through you to the Minister, can she please, please update the House on the initiatives that are taking place across the province Question. to raise awareness about consent and sexual violence and the harassment against women? Thank you, Minister of Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Beaches East York for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, all Ontarians should feel safe from sexual violence and harassment in their communities, workplaces, and homes. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that many women and girls just aren't safe in their communities. Women are 11 times more likely to be sexually victimized, and this is absolutely unacceptable. That's why it's important for us to recognize Sexual Assault Prevention Month and the work being done province-wide to end sexual violence and harassment. Mr. Speaker, earlier this month, I attended the Regional Sexual Violence Conference in Mississauga, hosted by the Peel Committee Against Women Abuse. I heard about some incredible work happening on the ground to combat sexual violence and harassment and to keep women safe. Organizations like the Amelia Rising Sexual Assault Centre are working hard to combat sexual violence and harassment. Yes, sir. They are holding healing workshops, talks, and exhibits to highlight the importance of supporting survivors. Good and I'll work. tell you about more Thank later. You. Good work. The minister for the very important work that she's doing on this very pressing file. Yes. Now I'm very pleased to hear about the events that are taking place across the province. It's important that we raise awareness and keep the discussion going. Without organizations such as the ones that the minister has now mentioned and our frontline service providers, survivors would not be getting the kinds of supports that they need. But, Speaker, we all know we have an important role to play and that we need organizations to work with us to further raise awareness. As part of our new It's Never OK action plan to stop sexual violence and harassment, we created the Creative Engagement Fund. Organizations such as Le Centre Ontarien de Prevention des Agressions, through its project entitled Rights First, is creating a social change in preventing violence and sexual harassment. Question. By creating and presenting a series of three short films. Mr. Speaker, will the minister please inform us about this important work and the successful recipients from the Engagement Fund? Minister. Good question. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member again for this important question and for his advocacy on this vital issue. Mr. Speaker, in order to eliminate sexual violence and harassment, we know we need to raise awareness and build supports for this issue, not just during the month of May. And Mr. Speaker, recently, I had the honour to do just that by announcing the new recipients of the Creative Engagement Fund. Speaker, 
Art speaks in a language everyone understands and can have incredible healing powers. So I'm proud that our three-year commitment to this initiative has expanded to fund 20 projects across the province. Wow. These projects are important. They spark meaningful dialogue in communities and help eliminate sexual violence and harassment in homes, workplaces and society. Yes, Mr. Speaker, in addition to the four new Toronto projects, we have added projects throughout Ontario in Mississauga, Peterborough, Hamilton, Woodbridge Thank and you. London, doing our best yeah, yeah. to build support. New question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Education, workplace violence against Ontario's teachers in our classrooms continues to grow. 30% of teachers have said that they've received no training related to workplace violence. Most alarmingly, Speaker, 55% of teachers say that they've been pressured by their employer not to report violent incidents. Is it the policy of the Ministry of Education that violent incidents which occur between a teacher and their student in the classroom should go unreported? Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I know that um, this is a very serious issue that we take very seriously, and um, we want to ensure that our schools and our school boards are safe places uh, for all students and our education workers, Mr. Speaker. And that is why we are we partner with and we work together with all of our education partners on this issue of violence in schools, because we want to ensure that uh, that there are real solutions that are, are put forward. You raised the, uh, the question of training. Um, this is a, 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 an area that we are focused on. In fact, uh, we have done training with the um, Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario for professional development training uh, for, for teachers. In our um, our two-year curriculum for all new teachers includes yes, uh, aspects of classroom management to ensure that we are in, that our schools are safe uh, places for all education workers and all students. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, back to the Minister of Education. A recent Global News TV report highlighted the violence that students and teachers experienced in classrooms at the Durham District School Board schools. Sad. Speaker. Teachers should be able to teach. Students should, be able, should not be afraid to go to school. And parents should be confident in their children's safety. When will this Liberal government address violence in classrooms and protect Ontario students and teachers? Thank you. Yes, sir. So, so, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, that's why we're investing in our schools here in Ontario. We want to ensure that uh, we create the best opportunity possible for all students um, to receive a, 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 an education. And we have a, a policy of equitable and in inclusive classrooms uh, in our schools. Uh, we want to ensure that all students of all abilities are welcome in classrooms across Ontario. And even if you look at the investments that we're making in the member opposite's uh, own school board in the Durham School Board, which I have had the opportunity to visit. Um, I went to Notre Dame um, Secondary School, and uh, what a great school with uh, um, Richardson attached. Uh, it's a community hub school, and, uh, and, and what a fabulous campus. And yes, you see the, the learning that is happening in those schools, $98 million in more funding for special education for Durham School Boards. We're taking this issue of violence in schools very seriously. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. A few years ago, the 40 racetrack was facing closure. The residents of the town rallied and were able to come together and ensure the track survived. Premier, yourself is committed to rural Ontario. I also said you're committed to ensuring the 40 racetrack stays open. The new stabling policy put forth by Woodbine Entertainment will put the Fort Erie racetrack out of business. Brutal. Premier, the mayor of Fort Erie, the CEO of Fort Erie Racetrack have both written you regarding this policy, stabling policy. The stabling policy and the introduction of $5,000 claimers, $6,200 claimers, is designed, designed to put the Fort Erie racetrack out of business, pure and simple. Premier, we are going to lose 1,000 jobs in that town. Premier, will you step in Question. today, stand up for small horse racing tracks in Ontario and thousands of livelihoods that depend on Thank you stepping you. in and stopping?
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the uh, the member for Niagara Falls. I've got the letter that uh, that he delivered to me. Thank you very much for that and for bringing this to uh, to my attention, um, Mr. Speaker. I know that the Minister of uh, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is going to be meeting with the member. Uh, the member has asked whether there could be a broader meeting with the uh, the Mayor of, uh, of Fort Erie and the CEO of Fort Erie Racetrack. Um, we're prepared to do that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think that it would also be a good idea for the minister. Minister of Finance to be part of that conversation. Mr. Speaker, I, I did stand up for racing in this province, Mr. Speaker. We changed course, if I can say, and we made sure that there was a strategy that would allow uh, small race tracks to survive. I want to continue on that track, Mr. Speaker, and I will absolutely commit to work with the member and with our colleagues to make sure that happens, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I beg to inform the House that during the recess of the following, a report was tabled. On May 24, 2017, a report from the Financial Accountability Officer entitled An Assessment of the Financial Impact of the Province's Fair Hydro Plan. I also want to and beg, uh, beg to inform the House that during the recess, the following report was tabled. On May 23, 2017, the report of the Integrity Commission of Ontario concerning the review of expense claims covering period April 1, 2016 to March 31, 2017, under the Cabinet Minister's and Opposition Leaders' Expenses Review and Accountability Act 2002. Minister of Finance, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I wish to uh, advise the House that we have a prominent constituent of Mississauga South here with us today who happens to also be the mayor of the entire city of Mississauga. Please welcome Mayor Bronnie Crombie to the legislature. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I just noticed a constituent of mine up in the uh, West Public Gallery, Mr. Tim Bologna, who is a superintendent with the Peterborough, Victoria, Northumberland, and Newcastle Roman Catholic Separate School Board, Mr. Baloney. Thank you. Amendment from Shomar Dundas, South Bengali, on point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, the Most Reverend uh, Bishop of uh, uh, Marcel Dampous. He was the former Bishop of Alexandria Cornwall, and he's now the current Bishop of Sault Ste. Marie. So welcome. Welcome. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change on a point of order. Yes, I'd like to wish the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport happy birthday, Mr. Speaker. We have a deferred vote on the government notice of motion number 31 relating to allocation of time on Bill 68, an act to amend various acts in relation to municipalities. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. <coughs> On May 18, 2017, Ms. Jazik posted uh, government notice of motion number 31 relating to allocation of time on Bill 68. All those in favour, please rise one at a time to recognize by the clerk. Mr. Naki. Mr. Naki. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Molly. Ms. Martin. Ms. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Ronaldo. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, be rise. One at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Harvey. Mr. Harvey. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Salmaskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmaskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Coe. Mr. Nicktonell. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cole, Mr. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Van Toff. Mr. Van Toff. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Madame Gelina. Madame Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The eyes are 51, the nays are 38. The eyes being 51 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the note of government notice of motion number 32 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 114, an act to provide an anti racism measures. Call in the members, this will be a five. Six. Same vote? Same vote? Carried. The eyes are 51, the nays are 38. The ayes being 51 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon. Oh. I do. Uh, we are dismissed, but I need to make this announcement. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Whitby, Oshawa, has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Education concerning violence in classrooms. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. We are now dismissed.